Hi, I'm Jonathan Chung, tech lead on the Google Play Console, working on go-to-market tools. And I'm here today with my colleagues Ignacio from the Play Business Development Team and David, product manager on Play Console. We are excited to talk to you about what Play Console tools you can take advantage of when building and managing your games. Fact, in the last few years, the number of Android players who have installed a game has more than doubled. Players from all around the world and from all different backgrounds are enjoying an unprecedented amount of new gameplay experiences on Android. As game developers, this is your chance, your chance to build new experiences, to connect to more players, and to find success in the market. Whether you're a new developer building your first game or a seasoned veteran of the industry, the opportunity is yours to grasp. That being said, with opportunity comes a degree of risk. Games development on mobile is an ever-changing landscape, and player expectations on mobile games has never been higher. There's more competition than ever before in the marketplace. There are already one, billion, uh, one million games live on the Play Store, and new games are launching all the time on Google Play. Development costs are increasing due to the demands for higher fidelity on mobile games, and consumers are expecting more feature-rich experiences on mobile. Finally, marketing games is getting increasingly more difficult. User acquisition spending is increasing as developers are moving towards fewer, larger launches in a single year. At Google Play, we understand these problems and want to help you where we can to bring as much success as possible to your games. We are committed to building tools to help you plan and de-risk your launches and to help you maintain and support your games after a successful launch. Let us take you on the journey from pre to post launch, which will hopefully provide some insights into the, some of the exciting tools we have available for you. We will be covering some existing tools, share some interesting anecdotes and best practices, and show off some new tools which we feel will help you on your road to success. First, pre launch. This phase is critical for making sure you are delivering the right experience for your players, whether that be in the gameplay experience itself, the stability and performance of your game, or in the content roadmap you have planned. We're going to be going through some areas of focus during pre-launch and also walk through some of these tools we feel are helpful at this stage. First, and perhaps most importantly, testing. It is crucial to get your testing strategy right when launching a new game. As you know, launching and maintaining games is an expensive proposition. It is critical to make sure that when you launch your product, it will be stable and bug-free, resonate with your players from a gameplay perspective, and have a sustainable roadmap to keep your players invested in your game. Internal testing allows you to publish and distribute your APKs in seconds instead of hours so you can push your daily builds to your team immediately. It also features integrations with our API and other third-party plugins such as Gradle. Finally, it benefits from all the Google Play products you come to love, such as in-app product support, country targeting, LVL, and of course, the newly announced Android app bundle. Developers are using this new track to do rapid, iterative testing for launching new games as well as for adding features to existing games. For instance, using it to push their daily builds to QA in order to make sure the releases meet their bar for quality, or using it to push experimental builds to a group of friends and colleagues in order to play test new gameplay mechanics. Here are some things to think about when using internal testing. It's a great opportunity to focus on stability and bugs 
in order to judge every release against your bar for quality. If possible, it can also be useful to start testing on a wide variety of devices so that when you decide to roll out to more players, you can be certain they will receive the quality gameplay experience that you will want them to receive. One of our most used features for game developers is closed testing. Closed testing is a great opportunity to build a tight-knit community of testers who will be able to provide you with valuable feedback before and after launch. Users can be invited directly from the Play Console using email lists or Google Groups. They can then opt in via web app, as shown in this picture. Uh, once opted in, they can install the game directly from the Play Store. Over 60% of game developers on Play already use this feature and have found great success with it. Let's take a quick look at a case study. BravoCo, where the game Forces of Freedom really took to heart the philosophy of building a strong tester community for their closed test. They focus on recruiting the right sort of players, even reaching beyond the usual online communities, to find the sort of player they felt would have the affinity with the theme of their game, which is a military shooter game. As you can see in this picture, they went to this airsoft event and recruited players on site to play their game. During the testing period, BravoCo made sure that they were available 24-7 via social media and especially instant messaging. This allowed them not only to gather very specific, valuable feedback, but also to build connections with individual testers of their game. This dedication to building a strong tester community paid off dividends, both during testing and even after launch in early access, where Forces of Freedom has now attracted more than 10 million players and counting. In conclusion, here are some things to think about when using closed testing. Create a strong and diverse tester community. Remember, these players will be critical in shaping the initial direction of your game. Experiment with new gameplay mechanics and content. Don't be afraid of negative feedback. Remember, your ratings and reviews are still not live at this point. And finally, think, out, think about reaching out to your tester community to gather very specific feedback. This is your chance to ask them what worked, what didn't work, and how do we improve? Next, open testing. Once a game is technically solid and your main gameplay hooks are built in, it's time to think about expanding your test to more players in preparation for your big launch. Open testing allows your game to be discoverable and installable on the Play Store and for players up to a developer-defined cap to opt in and install your game. Players won't be able to leave ratings until the game fully launches, but can provide anonymous feedback to the developer at any time. Open testing comes in two flavors, depending on the state of your game. If you don't have a production release already, or in the same country as you're running your test in, users will be able to install your game directly from the Play Store without needing to opt in. We call this early access. Your game will be tagged as unreleased, as shown in this image. If you have a production release already, for instance, you may have soft launched in the same country, you can still continue to use open testing. Existing users will continue to get updates on the test track, and new users can opt in via a, a console-provided web link or through the card, which is shown on the screen here, at the bottom of the game's details page. Players opting into an open test in this state will see the game tagged as beta. So bringing together these forms of testing, with internal tests and closed tests, you, as the developers, have control over who can install and play your game. Early access tests can be installed and discovered directly from the Play Store, and they're a great way to expand your tester base as well as building hype around your big launch. Finally, open tests can be used to continue testing with a wide audience even after your production release. Utilize these testers to try out new features and tweaks to your game before rolling out to all your players.
Moving on. Pre-launch reports can also help developers iron out quality and performance issues prior to launch. Whenever a test APK is uploaded, a non-deterministic bot will crawl your game while it's running on a real physical device in one of our test labs. Game developers have found a lot of value in the pre-launch report. 90% of developers don't push to production if the report shows issues. Demo loops goes even further for game developers. Record and upload a game demo loop using Firebase Test Lab and receive a PLR report on crash and performance metrics, including the all-important frames per second. This allows you to discover rendering issues even faster and launch with greater confidence. Half Brick Games, the developers of titles such as Fruit Ninja and Jetpack Joyride, have found great values in demo loops. They've evolved their QA processes around using PLR demo loops, as it allows them to check for visual glitches, crashes, and performance, among many other things. They rely on the fact that PLR will automatically run on a wide range of devices and device specs for every test release. So how did they do this? Their new game, which is an endless runner, has a built-in replay functionality, which are used to record and save interesting game runs. With a few simple lines of code, they can instrument PLR demo loops to run on these recorded sessions. Whereas before, it was a very manual process to kick off their benchmarking. Now, with PLR demo loops, it's automated for them for every test release. They can look at these metrics and compare them to every previous release to make sure that their game has no regressions in terms of performance. Before we move over to launching, another important aspect of pre-launch is to plan your strategy around content. As such, don't be afraid to test longer and to test earlier. Consider using longer-term metrics like D14 and D30 in order to predict future success. Measure the rate of content consumption during your testing phase. This can be useful for planning ahead so that you have enough content for your players when you launch until your first big update. Also, this phase is a great opportunity to test what sort of live op events will resonate with your player base so that you can create the content that your players will want to perceive. It is also important to consider how different forms of testing can be used to achieve different purposes. All testing tracks can be used in unison with each other, allowing you to target different experiences to different groups of testers. For instance, you may want to consider to run your daily builds past your internal test track users to check for regressions at the same time as you're running a large-scale open test with early access. Closed testing can also be used to fine-tune specific gameplay mechanics with a select audience before rolling out to production test users. I mean, your production users. Finally, you should always keep in mind that mobile games development is an ever-changing landscape. New technologies are opening up new ways to play, and player expectations on mobile are ever-changing. Remember to continuously evaluate your processes around development and testing, see what works, what doesn't work, and most importantly, do not be afraid of change. With that, I would like to hand over to Ignacio, who's going to talk to you about launching games on Google Play. Thanks, Jonathan. Hi, everyone. I'm Ignacio. I'm part of the Play team based in London. And I have the privilege and honor to work with many game developers like you. So let's talk about launching your game. I'm pretty sure that by now you have tested and tested your game, and you are 100% confident, or let's say at least 95% confident, that your game is ready both from the back end and front end to receive a lot of users, that as well, your customer teams are ready to manage the community, create new live events, or deal with the feedback, but above all, that your game is lots of fun. And so you have a launch date, and it's still scary, right? So well, luckily in the Play team, in the Play console, you have some tools that will help you 
to reach those levels of confidence. And today, for the launch part, we're going to talk about three in particular. We're going to talk about device catalog. We're going to talk about pre-registration. And then last, country targeting. Let's look at them in further detail. So device catalog. This feature, it's very popular. And the reason is because it helps you make better decisions when prioritizing bug fixes and delivering the right experience for each device. Since launch last year, we have seen that 66% of developers are using it on a monthly basis. We all know that Android is an incredibly rich ecosystem with hundreds of manufacturers and thousands of devices. So let's turn these into an opportunity and try to deliver the best experience based on relevant factors such as SOC, RAM, or CPU. But during this process, there's one key thing to remember, which is essentially to think big. And what I mean by think big is just let's try to include as many devices by default as possible. Excluding devices should be a temporary measure until some of these bugs are fixed. Let's look at the device detail page. The device detail page is a feature that allows you to review individually thousands of devices and identify relevant criteria such as RAM, SOC, or CPU. Since last year, we added new filtering methods, of, for example, screen size, density, and application binary interface. As well, since last year, we added the unsupported reason. So you can very quickly identify why a device isn't supported by your game. Lastly, I wanted to highlight also some interesting information that the device detail page is providing. Essentially, the number of active devices in this, um, in this uh, particular game, the average rating, and the revenues generated by inner purchases or subscri subscriptions in the last month. So what some of the developers are saying about this? So Digital Legends, a mobile developer from Barcelona, they actually uh, launched a very popular game, um, Respondables, which was launched in 2014. And since then, they have seen more than 30 million installs. And what is more important, more than 2 billion battles played by the players. So Digital Legends, two or three times a week, they check the device catalog. And essentially, they do three things. The first one, they exclude those devices that they do not meet the minimum requirements in order to deliver a great user experience. Then second, they isolate the bugs. And then third, they prioritize device support and, as well, these bug fixes. So thanks to this feature, Digital Legends has seen an increase in the user experience and ratings, as well on the overall quality and performance of the game. So in conclusion, I wanted to highlight three things to remember. So the first one, think big and support as many devices as possible. Second, if we have to exclude some devices, try to do it in a temporary way so we can fix all those bugs and increase our chances to reach a bigger audience. And then last, use the device detail page to get very relevant information, such as, for example, the unsupported reason or the average revenues or average rating. And with this, let's move on to the next functionality feature, pre-registration. We all know that in gaming, creating excitement before even launch is increasingly critical and popular. So the pre-registration feature has two benefits. As a player, it's clear. You can pre-register, and then when the game is launched, you will receive a notification to install the game. We all know that in certain type of games, multiplayer, social games, competitive games in general, it's critical to have a very early or get, get on early into, into the game. However, from a developer perspective, I can see that there's two main benefits here. The first one is you can start marketing early and capture the audience interest. As well, by monitoring the pre-reg count, we have an indication of the influx at users, of users at launch. And we can plan ahead, not only from a server side, but also like marketing. So let's look at a case study. Nexon is a Korean developer and the creator of some popular games, in particular, Durango Wild Lines, which was launched in Korea the 25th of January, 2018. So they started the pre-reg process six weeks before launching the game. And during this time, they saw 
2.5 million pre-registration users. Out of those 2.5 million users, pre-reg users, 46% were coming from the Play uh, pre-registration feature. And what is very interesting here is that the day seven conversion, meaning from launch date until the day seven, the first week, the conversion for Play pre-reg users was about 70% which is seven times higher than the other sources. So as Kiki Hillman, the head of platform relations, says, Google pre-registration is essentially a very effective marketing tool. So how is Nexon using for other games? So Nexon has launched 20 games in 2017 and has used the pre-registration feature in 10 games last year. 50%, they saw a 50% conversion from pre-reg users to actual users downloading these app this game. They have seen also that the CPIs are quite lower. They're 60% lower in pre-launch than in post-launch period. And as such, this has led to a decision to allocate the marketing budget 50% to the pre-launch stage rather than in post-launch. So far, the pre-registration pilot has been very successful. In 2017, we've seen numbers such as more than 50 developers using this functionality, as well 200 million players registering and 100 million players actually downloading those games, and then a total of 400 launches across both small and big developers. Indeed, this is exciting. But what is even more exciting is to know that today we are announcing that pre-reach is becoming available to all developers very soon. So what are the, some, some of the things that we need to take into account if we want to have a good experience with pre-reach? So three things as well that I wanted to remember. So the first is allow some time to build the excitement. So in between three to six weeks, it's enough in order to gather all this audience interest. But as well, use all the channels that, that you have available in order to build that excitement. For example, media, communities, forums, your own website. And across all these channels, make sure that you have a clear action. In this, in this case, pre-register in Google Play. With this in mind, let's jump into the last tool, which is country targeting. Country targeting is a very powerful tool. And essentially, it allows two things. So first, we can have different tracks per country. And then we can run separate closed open test or production in a specific geography. This is very useful, as the quote mentions, for soft launching processes where, for example, we want to have one particular region in production to test user acquisition or monetization. Secondly, it's key during launch, because we can use a stage rollout per geography. And this means that you can control the rollout in different countries and then monitor which users are getting into the app. This allows us to test server performance or user feedback. So let's look at how some developers are using this functionality. So Wargaming, Ukrainian developer and behind the game World of Warship Blitz, they launched this game in January 2018 as well. And the game has already seen more than 3 million instants in Google Play. By the way, 100 million ships destroyed and more than 15 million played shut down. So incredible numbers as well on that side. And we spoke with Raymond Cheng, which is the marketing, who is the marketing manager in Wargaming. And he told us that they used the country targeting during the soft launch period. This soft launch period took uh, about six months, and they divided in three stages. So the first stage, they select a few number of countries, and they were testing things like stability, so crash rates, monetization, lifetime value, and CPI, and then engagement, which is user engagement and duration of the games. On a second stage, they open up to a fewer more countries, and they were testing mostly server capacity and ensuring the stability of the game. And then on a third stage, they were open up to already more countries across all continents with the intent of testing monetization mostly. So lastly, during this whole process, Wargaming was testing as well, and monitoring the ratings and the reviews and reacting based on the user feedback. So in conclusion, regarding country targeting, two things to remember today. So the first one is like we can use tar country targeting during soft launch 
but also during the open and closed best beta test uh, processes, as well as during even like future updates or post-launch period. And the second thing is, at launch, plan ahead what is going to be the rollout to the different countries. So as fans in all the world can download the game and enjoy it quickly, but without any issues. And with these, I would like to call my colleague, David. Thank you. Thanks, Ignacio. I'm David, product manager on Play Console Go to Market Tools and Google Play Game Services. Now we're moving on to post launch. At this point, you've developed your game, tested with a growing cohort of testers, had a good launch day and a strong launch week, and the dust of the settling. What are the things that you're going to be thinking about next? Three post launch activities that we're going to focus on are growing your audience to get as many people as possible playing your great game, engaging your players by delivering a great experience that they want to keep coming back to, and earning money so you can keep running your game or build your next one. Let's start with audience growth. Players are becoming harder and more expensive to acquire and retain. Game developers like you are using lots of different strategies to acquire users. UA is common, but so are other less trackable methods. Cross-promotion in other games, leveraging YouTube influencers, utilizing social channels, third-party website marketing, and I'm sure you have other great methods too. You can track clicks and installs from ads, but players who install your app organically from the Play Store who may get there, say, via search after reading about your game on a third-party website are a black box while accounting for the majority of installs for most developers. Using the new tools in Organic Acquisition Insights Report in Play Console, you can now see the breakdown of how many new installers have accessed your listing either via search or by browsing the Play Store. Most users find games in Google Play using search. And with this tool, you can dive deeper into search and see the specific search terms that drive users to your game. Organic Acquisition Insights Reports is coming soon for all developers. The developers we've talked to are excited to use these insights in order to assess their acquisition strategies, change their store listing and screenshot to reflect what their users are looking for, and even optimize in-app onboarding experiences to ensure that it references the features and benefits that the users find most appealing. This is a powerful new tool that I hope you'll explore. To find out more about Organic Acquisition Insights, you can go to this talk tomorrow morning. Next, we'll talk about Google Play Instant. Growing your game involves getting users excited about it, and a great way to do that is to give them a quick and easy way to experience it. For a quick background, we launched Instant Apps at I.O. last year, and since then, we've been very busy. There are more than a billion devices that support Instant Apps, and we've improved our tooling to make building Instant Apps even easier. And as you may have heard, we announced that we're bringing Instant Apps to games at GDC six weeks ago. And as of today, Google Play Instant is now available to all game developers. So why should you consider making an Instant game? Instant games allow players to try your game before installing it and make it easy to install the full game at the end of the Instant Game experience using the Install Prompt API. Being able to try a game before installing is a hit with players, and after publishing their Instant Game, Mighty Battles has seen a 19% increase in acquisition rate. So what's the difference between Instant Apps and Instant Games? What we've done is adapt the Instant App frameworks so it better meets the, meets the needs of game developers like you. There are three things we've changed. We've increased the size limit to 10 megabytes. We've enabled progressive download of executable code and assets using the Splits and Solis API. And very importantly, we've added full support for native code and are integrating with game engines and OpenGL. This means you can use the same code base and tools as your full game to build your instant game. And by creating an instant game, you open up a lot of surfaces. Players can experience instant games directly from ads, in the Play Games app arcade, via a link you can send with a messaging app, and of course, in the Play Store. While we're on the topic of Google Play Instant, 
we need to touch back just for a moment on launching tools. Pre-Reg is a very successful program, and we're bringing the instant games to Play Store's pre-registration feature. Now players that pre-register can get a sneak preview of your game. And when you promote pre-registration through social media, email, or on your website, users will be able to play instantly from any Android device. It's an awesome way to introduce your game to the world. To learn more about instant games, you can attend this session on Thursday. Next, we'll look at engagement. Android Vitals is designed to help you identify issues at scale so you can create a better, more fluid, more optimized, and more engaging experience for your players. There are a number of new Vitals features launching, including benchmarks for all Vitals and new Vitals, including startup time, which were discussed in the Android Vitals session earlier this afternoon. Of particular interest for game developers like you are stability and battery vitals. Stability vitals include ANRs and crashes, and batteries include stuck wake locks and excessive wake ups. We are now showing these vitals against a bad behavior threshold. Exhibiting bad behavior in vitals will negatively infect the user experience in your game and can result in bad ratings and poor discoverability in the Play Store. We also have vitals for rendering and startup time, though these are informative at this point. And with the new Vitals benchmarks, you can see how you stack up against similar games. It's important to know that Android Vitals is a powerful tool, not just for app developers, but for game developers too. Using Vitals, game developer Kalu, whose game Subway Surfers just passed 1 billion installs on Google Play, was able to make drastic improvements to their ANR rate, reducing it from around 2% to below 0.1%. So to help you ensure your users enjoy playing your game, how should you th be thinking about using Vitals in your day to day? Keep an eye on ANRs, crashes, wake locks, and wake ups, which will be easier with the notifications and alerts built into Play Console. And use the Vitals dashboard as part of your toolkit to chase down problems. Now, we wanted to share with you something we've been working on. It's not ready for general consumption yet. That's coming. But we were excited to be working to bring live ops to play. We are creating new experiences in the store and in the Play Games app to show players the events that are happening now in their games. This is proving very popular with players, and we're going to continue exploring in this direction. And finally, let's move on to revenue. Google Play has had subscriptions since 2012, but they've mostly been the domain of subscription for access apps. Games typically monetize through IAPs and ads or are paid games. But a number of developers have been experimenting with subscriptions, and we wanted to share their experiences. You may be wondering, what's the business case of adding subscriptions when I already have IAP? Developers who implement subscriptions report an increase in engagement and retention, not just for the subscribers, but for their overall user base as well, as you can see from Monster Strike's experience with MonPass. Many, including Scopely, also notice minimal cannibalization of IAP, resulting in incremental gains to overall revenue, driven by both subscriptions and IAP. Another developer who's found success with subscriptions is Network in Legendary Game of Heroes. They use subscriptions for their VIP loyalty program. This program has proved popular with players, as you can see, and has created a new revenue stream for Legendary Game of Heroes with strong positive impact on overall revenue. There are two best practices in using subscriptions to provide value to players. Loyalty programs for your high value users and a new access point to premium experience for traditional non-buyers. The target audience will influence how you choose to design your offering. Some examples of a VIP loyalty program features include exclusive or, exclusive or early access to content, special in-game VIP status and title, or a bonus payout with each purchase. This is the most popular subscription design we've seen so far, and as you can see from Ludia's Jurassic World The Game implement here. Developers have also found that subscriptions can be effective in converting traditional non-buyers. These players are motivated by getting a good financial deal. You can see Network's implementation here, which is a VIP loyalty program aimed at these traditional non-buyers. Of course, as with any monetization system, 
be aware of potential downsides, and keep a close pulse of fair player feedback and community sentiment. To help you with your subscription program, Google Play has a very robust subscriptions infrastructure with a lot of rich features. We support you with billing tools and analytics insight reports throughout the entire user funnel. And we can take care of useful subscription features, such as uh, flexible billing, free trials, account hold, so you can focus on testing and implementing an effective in-game subscription design. To learn more about subscriptions, you can watch the recording of this session from earlier this afternoon. We've gone through some of the tools that you can take advantage of post-launch. But as we draw to a close, I want to loop us back to the beginning of our talk and call out testing again. It's good to always be testing. In comparison to apps, this can be tricky for games, as games, some games need users to be on the same version to function properly. But think about how you can effectively use Play's testing tracks, which will all work as well post-launch as they do pre-launch, to ensure your updates live up to the quality bar set for your game. To wrap up, we've discussed a number of tools in Play Console you can use in various stages of your game's lifecycle. There's a lot going on in mobile gaming right now, with fantastic gamer growth, loads of high-quality games being released, and lots of competition. It's your own fault as you keep raising the bar higher and higher in terms of graphics, story, and gameplay. Well done. We're excited to see what you're able to build next and where gaming goes from here. The tools we've talked to you through today can help you along your journey in a few key places and give you some abilities and insights you can leverage to help you succeed. We'd also love to hear your feedback on this session. Thanks for your time. We're around for the rest of the day, and you can also check out the sandbox over here. Thank you. <laughs>